Good morning. My name is Gay Lookabelle, and I'm one of the uh, teachers at the Discovery class here at First Baptist Church. This morning, I'd like to open with a prayer, because in these times, I think we really need to pray as much as we possibly can. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all together today on this special day to learn more about your word. Be with our students and teachers as they deal with the bring injuries into the school and into learning. Be with the COVID patients and the doctors and the first responders trying to deal with them. Also, please wrap your arms around the Gulf Coast states who are dealing with this terrible hurricane. Please have people open up their hearts and listen to these words today. And in all this, we ask in your name, in Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. I'm sure everyone has heard the story, the childhood story, of Hans Brinkler and the Silver Skates. This little Dutch boy was walking through his community and there was a little hole in the dike. Now this was a small boy, but he stuck his finger in the dike and he was the unexpected hero by saving that community. Every somebody thought he was too young to do anything, but he was a hero and he did something very heroic. All of us can. We don't have to think we're small and insignificant, but we can all be heroes. And with that in mind, we're going to be continuing in the story, in the series of God's Mysterious Grace. Today's lesson uh, follows what Ida was preaching a couple of weeks ago on Joseph. So now in Exodus, we're just going to be studying Moses. And this will be mainly the first part of Moses' life. And if all of us, all of us know Moses, and we've heard the stories, but Moses was the most majestic figure in the Old Testament. No one else in the Old Testament had the same relationship with God that Moses did. And if you read Exodus 33, 11, it says, quote, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friends. Now, very few people in the Bible can boast of that. Our lesson is in the book of Exodus. This is chapter 1 we're going to be studying, and also chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But instead of reading them to you, we're going to talk about them. A little background on Exodus is that the book of Exodus is the pivotal story of God's salvation for the Israelites through Moses. Before Moses, though, can play this role for God, several people must step up and save Moses. So five women are the unexpected heroines of his story in his beginning. They're just ordinary women who step up when action is needed. And if you know from all of our times in the Bible, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Ordinary people. What they do when they can, and God uses their efforts to bring about extraordinary results. Think about that. God works through their creative dealing with some challenging circumstances. Now, like I said, Iva had talked on, Iva Stowe had her lesson on Joseph. So I'm going to build on that. Exodus first chapter begins with the other 11 sons of Jacob settling in Egypt at Joseph's invitation. So Joseph invited his 11 brothers and their families to come to Egypt to live. The families grew and they multiplied. So the Israelites became numerous. Then everything changed, as happens in life. Joseph and his brothers all grow old and eventually die. Another king, or in Egypt they called him a pharaoh, becomes, comes into power over Egypt. This king doesn't know Joseph, 
or his work, the history of this nation, what all Joseph has built, and he does has no care about Joseph's descendants. So Joseph's families mean nothing to this Egyptian king. However, if you remember in the scriptures, Joseph, a Hebrew, Israelite, saved the people of Egypt from famine. So Joseph cared about the Egyptian people, but this new Egyptian Pharaoh cared nothing about the Israelites. All he sees is the tribes of Israel are growing. He sees these people as invaders, not the invited resident guests that they really are. Joseph invited them, but Joseph is gone. So this king or Pharaoh, the ruler, or Pharaoh was a ruler of ancient Egypt, so he fears these Israelites, and he tells and preaches and conveys all of his fears to his people, to the Egyptians. He's worried that they're going to take him over. Instead of leaving the Israelites alone to live peacefully beside the Egyptians, as they have for generations, this Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites. Now, there's not any documentation of any hostility or problems between the Egyptians and the Israelites. They don't even have an army. But the king or the Pharaoh is afraid He's paranoid. He's afraid that they're going to be more powerful than the Egyptians. So he is going to crush them before, in his mind, they can crush the Egyptians. Now, if we go back, remember God had promised Abraham that he would have many descendants. And so God had kept that promise because the Israelites were numerous. But remember, he also promised them the land of milk and honey. All right. What about that promise of the land? That large group of people is now enslaved in a foreign land. What is God going to do to save them? Pharaoh is trying to crush him. So he works the enslaved Israelites so hard that he wants to demoralize them and have them to the point of exhaustion that they cannot reproduce. But that doesn't work. They still reproduce, but they do the work of the Pharaoh. When he sees that doesn't work, he enlists two Hebrew midwives to kill the newborn Hebrew boys as they give birth, as they're giving birth, but to save the girls. These two midwives are God-fearing women, and they disobey the Pharaoh. They slip around and courageously step up to him and tell him that they cannot do that because the Hebrew women give birth before they can even get to them that they're not like the Egyptian women. The Hebrew women have already had their babies before the, he the midwives get there. Now these two are the first of the five heroic women that step up and save Moses. These two women are later blessed by God with children of their own. Well, since that didn't work with the Hebrew women, I mean the Hebrew uh, midwives, Pharaoh orders the Egyptian people, the Egyptian people now, to throw the male Hebrew babies into the Nile River. The Nile River has always been the source of life in Egypt, but now it's turned into a source of death for all the Hebrews, Hebrew and the boys. Moses is born to a Levite. The Levites are the priestly class, teachers, judges, the, the uh, Israelites that participate in the temple worship service. So his Levite parents, and his included, especially his mother, is the third creative person, the third creative woman 
she did not want to have her son thrown into the river, but she hid him for three months in her home. Now, anyone who's cared for a baby understands the difficulty of keeping a crying baby hidden from the public and for three months. She kept that baby hidden. Then, after three months, she realized she couldn't hide him any longer. So she put him in a waterproof reed basket and placed it in the grassy bank of the river, the same Nile River that he was supposed to be thrown into. Now, basket can be translated into ark, the same word we know for the vessel in the story of Noah. And of course, that was used also for God's salvation. So there's a, a wording of uh, ark and basket. Noah was in his basket, which like we said, is translated into ark. His sister, Miriam, who is the fourth heroic woman in the story, stayed risking her life and kept watch over him to see that nothing would happen to him or see what would happen to him. And at that point, if she'd have been caught, Pharaoh would have killed her. Through Miriam, though, God was watching over baby Moses. The basket became snagged in reeds along the river and is discovered by the same Pharaoh's daughter, who is the princess. Now, she is the fifth woman to play a big role in Moses' story. Knowing that her father had ordered the male Hebrew babies to be killed, she was taking quite a chance to even look at the baby, go to the baby, and touch him. Seeing that crying baby in that basket, though she took pity and motherly type instinct on him. Now, here's the princess looking at the baby, and she has her handmaidens go and bring him to her. In the meantime, Miriam, who's hiding in the, in the uh, reeds, bravely approaches this Egyptian princess and says to her, shall I get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, so Miriam went and brought back her mother, who, of course, is Moses' mother. There, Miriam was a very brave person to approach the Pharaoh's prince, the princess, the daughter, and also to suggest that she bring a nurse mother. So... Pharaoh's daughter told Moses' mother after she came back with Miriam to take this child and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So these three women, the princess, Miriam, and Moses' mother, they work together to make sure the baby's needs are met. His sister appears and offers and the so, but Moses is nursed in the same home that he was born in. So, with his sister appearing and offer to find someone to nurse him in her own home, you got to admit that's pretty heroic. And brave, heroic, brave, and you got to see God's hand in this. The baby's birth mother would nurse him, and ironically, She's paid from the Pharaoh's own royal treasury. She no longer has to hide him, since now he's the son of a princess. So Moses probably spent the first three years or so growing up with his birth mother in the Hebrew home of Levites. And then the rest of his growing years, the mother had to turn him back over to the princess and he was spent the rest of his growing years in the Egyptian palace. So he has lived in two different cultures which prepares him for what God wants him to do. 
We don't always know the plans that God has, but if we follow the, the path, we will know eventually. Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses, which means to draw out of, and in this case, draw out of from the water. Moses will be raised in the palace of the same Pharaoh who ordered him to be put to death along with all the Hebrew boys. But because of the five women who all took courageous and creative actions, when confronted with challenging circumstances, Moses lived. Everything seemed to be against Moses from the beginning. He was born into enslaved people. The Pharaoh issued a law that should have resulted in Moses' death as a newborn infant. But God used five brave, strong women who were willing to do what they could do to save that baby's life. As a result, Moses survived and grew up to lead God's people out of slavery and into freedom, but not without a lot of circumstances and difficulties. These women were created and very bold in the name of justice. We can see God's hand guiding them towards choices that were in line with God's plan for peace and justice in this world. We need to encourage each other to be open to God's working through us whether or not we're aware of it as it's happening. We don't know God's plans for us, but we need to trust it and to do as we feel is right and to do the right thing. God, uh, Moses' adult life, later on, as he was a young man walking through the streets, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. Moses killed that Egyptian and afterwards had to flee the palace because he knew the Pharaoh would kill him. He would be killed if he was caught. So he flee. He found a sheep farmer and married the daughter and helped his father-in-law in with the sheep. This is on into Exodus, but I'm just going to bring it kind of in, all in. Uh, so he married, helped his father-in-law with the sheep. While he was doing that, that was his first encounter. He encountered God at the burning bush. He walked over to this burning bush that was, he, he didn't see the bush dis, deteriorate. It was just a fire. Probably the, which was the best, best biblical epiphany at all, in all. This is where he gets God's instruction to lead the Hebrew people to the promised land, fulfilling that other promise that God made to Abraham of a land filled with milk and honey, God's promises. God keeps his promises. We just have to realize it and act on them. Following God's instructions, he eventually went to Pharaoh several times unsuccessful times to get the Pharaoh to release the Hebrew people so they could leave from their enslavement and journey to that promised land. You remember that he received the Ten Commandments from God, our laws of the land. Moses, following God's precise instructions, also constructed an ark of specialty wood covered with gold to hold and carry the Ten Commandments. He and his brother Abram did lead the people to the Promised Land, following a nearly 40-year journey with many trials and frustrations. But Moses did not get to enter the Promised Land. He did get to see it, but he died before he could and God had told him that he would not be at, he would not enter it. He died and God buried him in an undisclosed place. No one knows where Moses was buried, if he was buried. He may God may have ascended. We don't know. But 
Moses' burial place is undisclosed. All of this started with the courage and strength of five women. We need to step up and have the courage to do what God plans us to do. Let us pray. Again, we come to you, dear Heavenly Lord, with the aches of the COVID, with the yearnings to help the other the people in the Gulf Coast. Please wrap your arms around the Gulf Coast residents and please protect them from this deadly storm. We hope that you give us the love of everyone and to learn how to care for all people. Again, please help us with the COVID. Bring a healing to all this. Bless our students, our school staffs, all the people that are working so hard to provide educations. And please, again, open your, have, get us to open our hearts and let, let God work in us. In this name we pray, amen. I hope all of you stay safe, wear your mask, and I look forward to seeing you again. May God bless you all.